Hello friends and family, it's Christina. I'm over here in quarantine on my couch, eight months pregnant, my computer laptop on my lap and my Bible to the side of me filled with sticky notes. Can you see? So I'm gonna be doing a lot of flopping back and forth. Lord, I pray for this teaching to go well because I have a big one for you. And it requires a lot of digging into the Word. Praise God. We love the Word. Yay. Um, this teaching is a corrective teaching, and it's meant to give comfort. Um, I am seeing a lot of people out there who have learned from YouTube. And that's not always a bad thing. YouTube can have some really good, solid teachings. But because of the online availability of all kinds of teachings, some people are led astray or misled. So this is a corrective teaching. This is to present the case biblically that we are not in the tribulation at all, not yet, and not a single seal has been lifted. The seals do not lift until the tribulation begins. So these are the logical premises, and then we're just going to go get together and dig in the Word. The first premise is that, number one, the Bible is very clear that the Antichrist will not be revealed until the Restrainer is removed. The Restrainer is the Holy Spirit uniquely indwelling the Church. The second premise, the very first seal judgment to be lifted by Jesus is the Antichrist himself. So therefore, based on those two premises, the Church has to be out of here before any of the seal judgments begin. Again, this is a corrective teaching because there are so many theories out there and I've seen a lot of people buy into this thing that we're at the fifth or, or the rapture happens at the sixth judgment um, or whatnot. This is meant to be corrective, to give you hope that we are only feeling the, the birth pains, the warning signs that the tribulation is coming, but we're not going to go through any of the tribulation. And by we, I'm talking about the Bride of Christ. I'm talking about the five wise virgins who will be raptured. So let's dig into the Word because we love it and His Word is truth. Okay, first thing. <sighs> let's flip over here. Let's look at the first premise. The restrainer must first be removed. So we're going to head to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay, I'm going to read it just to overview the verses 1 through 5. So you need to know that Paul is telling the church at Thessalonica that, you know, I reminded you guys of this stuff before because he's already taught them in the first book. He taught them all about the rapture. That's the main rapture passage. And he taught them about the day of the Lord. That's a word that's um, used for the tribulations. He taught them extensively. If you read 1 Thessalonians, it's there's a lot of gem-packed information about the day of the Lord, the coming time of judgment, the church is not a part of that, the, the rapture happens first, etc. But what's happening is the church um, received a, a falsified letter or something that wasn't true, and um, so they started to believe that they were already in the day of the Lord. They were, they passed the rapture, they're in this time of trouble. So Paul's writing 2 Thessalonians to reassure them. And to kind of reteach what he already taught. So, let's dig in. Now, in regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to meet him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly unsettled or alarmed by a so-called prophetic revelation of a spirit or a message or a le or letter from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. Okay, don't be misled. It hasn't come yet. Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day will not come unless an apostasy comes first. And apostasy means a falling away from the faith. So a lot of people are going to fall away from the true faith and get lukewarm or believe things that aren't biblical anymore. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the one who is destined to be destroyed, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he actually enters and takes a seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. Okay, so Paul gave a quick overview 
of the first half of the tribulation. The Antichrist describing his character, what he does. He exalts himself over God. He even enters into the temple and he publicly proclaims himself as God. This is a quick, like a quick synopsis, a very quick synopsis of part of half of the tribulation. Okay. But really, really interesting and really pivotal. Pivotal. Verse six is really important. Verse six goes back to the beginning to add an essential detail. So verse six is everything. After giving a brief synopsis, he stops and goes back to add more detail. This is not the first time that this has happened in scripture. And I'm going to give an example later, but people get really confused because they only read the first few verses of second Thessalonians. And they say, look, the antichrist comes first. That means the church will be here for the time of the antichrist. But they need to continue to read the whole passage and do an in-depth study of what the restrainer is and what he's doing. So at verse six, Paul really puts the brakes on and says, but wait, you guys need to know this. This is essential. Let me read it in my translation first. Then I'm going to go back to the old English. <laughs> and now you know what restrains him, the antichrist from being revealed so that he will not be revealed at his own time. He doesn't get to decide when he's revealed. Something's restraining him. For the mystery of lawlessness, which means rebellion against divine authority, is already at work. But only until he who now restrains it is taken out of the way. Then the lawless one, or the Antichrist, will be revealed. And the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by the appearance of his coming at Jesus' second coming at the end of the tribulation. So, I took some notes from a really excellent study by Chuck Missler, Dr. Chuck Missler. It's only 13 minutes. I'm going to tag it at the end of this because he does a better job of teaching this, but I'm going to go through the highlights of what he says. Um, so this verse, now, <laughs> this is Old English, or, you know, King James Version. So I was reading from my Bible, the Amplified Bible, which I really love, but let's also look at this translation. Now ye know that that withholdeth, now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. Now this first subject is neuter present participle, and it represents this restraint as an impersonal operative force, like a spirit. Because in the Greek, the word for spirit is neuter. It's neither male or female. So that's an impersonal force in that verse. The restrainer prevents the premature manifestation of the man of sin as the embodiment of iniquity. And then, so it's, it's holding the man of sin back from, from coming fully into what he wants to be, complete lawlessness, you know, the, the, the Antichrist against God, indwelled by Satan himself. So let's look at verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth, which is an old English term for restrain, that's why my Bible says restrain, or hinder, will let until he be taken out of the way. So now this is interesting because while I said the grammar of verse 6 referred to it as a neuter, like talking about a spirit, because the word for spirit is neutral or neuter in the Greek. Now in verse 7, it's saying he, and that is a masculine term. So somebody is holding the man of iniquity back. And look at that line. It says, until he, talking about the spirit, the Holy Spirit, be taken out of the way. That's a specific event that has to happen. But it's in the subjunctive, meaning it can't be known yet. We don't know yet, but it is a specific event. We know from the writings of Paul that the restrainer right now is in us, the church. Paul explains in Ephesians how unique it is that the Holy Spirit is indwelling us. Also, we know in Acts 2 that at Pentecost, the unique relationship with the Holy Spirit indwelling the church began. So, when it says, he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, it's referring to a person. 
We know that the Holy Spirit is a person in the Trinity. He's not just some ethereal force. Okay, so now, now in verse 7, from verse 7 on, it's getting specific. The neuter participle in verse 6, which is required for the grammar of the word spirit, is now replaced by the masculine he to describe the personhood of the Holy Spirit. So the church and the Holy Spirit uniquely indwelling us are co-restraining this man of lawlessness or this man of iniquity or the Antichrist, those are all interchangeable words, from coming to power and being revealed. That's a brief um, notes that I took from Chuck Missler's teaching. He is so incredible. I'm going to attach his teaching below. It's only 13 minutes. But I want to tell you, people get really confused when they read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because if you just stop at verse 4, you misunderstand everything. But Paul goes back and really explains how important the restrainer is and that he is the one thing stopping the Antichrist from coming to power. Now, this is not the only time that this technique has been used in scripture. Okay, this is not our study. We're not looking at the creation story, but I'm just showing you another example of where this is done. This is also done in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. In Genesis chapter 1, we see the creation in the, the seven-day creation. God makes everything. He briefly mentions that God made man. He says um, in verse 27, So God made man in his own image, in the image and likeness of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. That's all it says about Eve's creation right there. And then it even, if you keep reading it, then it says, um, by the seventh day, he saw his completed work and all that was done and he rested. And so we see the work is done already by chapter two, verse two. But then if you keep reading in chapter two, it goes back and adds more details. It's not contradicting chapter one. It's going back and adding more details. And then in chapter 2, we see, we see a lot more about the creation of Eve, how it happened, why she was created. There's a lot more details added to chapter 2. It doesn't mean that scripture is contradicting scripture. It means after they tell a brief synopsis, then they stop and go back and add more detail. That happens sometime in scripture. That is exactly what's happening in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. It, it's not a chapter that contradicts itself. People really need to know that because that chapter, the first four verses, if you're only reading the first four verses, are taken out of context by those who believe that the church goes through the time of tribulation. And that's just a really bad study. And it's not true. Okay. So we already looked at how that happens in scripture. It's not contradictory. It's just adding vital details. Okay. So now we know that the restrainer which is the Holy Spirit uniquely indwelling the church, is holding back the Antichrist from coming to power. The next um, point that's really important to know from Scripture is that the very first seal that's lifted in Revelation is the Antichrist. Okay, so... In Revelation chapter 5, this is the chapter before we get to the seals, there is a scroll with seven seals that no one is able to open. I put a note, read it. Okay, I'm reading it because I a note to self. Revelation chapter 5. Okay. I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, closed and sealed with seven seals. Okay. Chuck Missler teaches that um, we've seen this before in the Bible, and a scroll that has writing on the inside and the outside is a title deed. That's a legal document of ownership. That's the only time we see that in the Bible. So this is a title deed to the earth, because there's writing on the inside and the outside of the scroll. And I saw a strong angel announcing with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. 
Then one of the 24 elders said to me, Stop weeping, look closely. The lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome and conquered. He can open the scroll and break its seven seals. Woo, Jesus! <laughs> so excited. So Jesus is the only one worthy and capable of opening up this title deed, this um, legal document of ownership for the work of the world. So... Jesus is the one that's lifting the seals to the scroll. That's important to know. He's the only one worthy. He's the only one that can do it. So when he pops a seal and the judgment comes, Jesus is the one doing that lifting of the seal. So when we get to Revelation chapter 6, we look at the first seal. That's the conqueror. This is the Antichrist. Let's look at the proof. The first seal is a writer on a white horse though he is not on though he is on a white horse he is not jesus jesus is the one opening the seals he can't open the seals and be the first thing coming out of it at the same time okay let me read it real quick and then we'll go into the details then i saw the lamb jesus christ break one of the seven seals of the scroll initiating the judgments and i heard one of the four living creatures call out with a voice of thunder come I looked, and behold, a white horse of victory, whose rider carried a bow, and a crown of victory was given to him, and he rode forth, conquering and to conquer. That's all the information we have there, but it's jam-packed. Let's take a look. Okay, first of all, this guy's physical description is different from Jesus' physical description, and I'm not talking about Jesus on earth. I'm talking about the glorified Jesus in heaven that we see in Revelation. Okay, so this guy, let's look at Revelation 19 that describes Jesus. Revelation 19 says, and I saw heaven opened, this is verse 11, and behold, a white horse and he who is riding it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many royal crowns. And he has a name inscribed on him which no one knows or understands except himself. He's he is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Okay. Um, Jesus has, where was that verse? No, 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 no. Verse 13. No. Nope. I lost it. I just read it. Wages war. Oh, verse 12. And on his head are many royal crowns. Okay, so Jesus has more than one crown on him, and they're a specific kind. They're the royal crowns. There's a word in Greek for royal crowns, crown of royalty. And there's a separate word in Greek for a crown of victory. Imagine um, the leafy things that they got at the, at the early Olympics. Those were victor's crowns. And so... That's why the language is so specific that this rider on the white horse has a crown of victory. That's a different word for the type of crown that Jesus has, and Jesus has many. So this guy is not Jesus. He doesn't have the robes dipped in blood. He doesn't have a, a secret name inscribed on him like Jesus has. Okay, so their adornment is different. And, oh yeah, and then in Revelation 19, on Jesus' robe and on his thigh are inscribed King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We don't see that on this guy here. So a lot of people just see, oh, white horse. That must be Jesus. Jesus rides a, a white horse. But just remember, the Antichrist is an imposter Christ. He's trying to deceive people into thinking that he is the anointed one. So there's a reason why he's on a white horse of victory. He's trying to be the Messiah, but he is not the Messiah. He does not fit those physical um, attributes of what we see in Jesus in Revelation, the same book. Now, this rider on the white horse carries a bow. Now, the law of first mentioned is, used, is a type of study, is a type of hermeneutical study, used by both Christian scholars and Jewish scholars. And it is when oh, the meaning of a word might be unclear or unknown. What you do is you look up the first time that word was ever mentioned or used in scripture. So if we look up the word bow in scripture, 
right? Because it's kind of weird that he only has a bow and no arrows. So that's like a, hmm, we should look into this. There's only a bow and no other, no arrows and nothing else is mentioned with it. So when you look in scripture and look for the word bow, the same word is used in Genesis 9 that is used here in Revelation 6. Even though we're talking about two different languages, it's still the same word. So in Genesis 9, it was a symbol of a covenant. The word rainbow isn't actually used. They just use the word bow in Genesis 9. That rainbow is the first covenant, the covenant between God and all mankind. The rainbow was the symbol of this covenant that God would never destroy the world again by flood. So the law of first mention says that this guy who looks like an imposter of Christ riding on a white horse, but only has a crown of victory, not a crown of royalty. He has a bow, which could be the covenant because of this studying tool and looking up the law of first mention. And it's also important to know that when you're looking in the book of Daniel, which is a huge prophetic book for the end times and the false messiah, in Daniel chapter 9, first let me get there. Here we go. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, we see that this seven year time period, we call it either the tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble or the 70th week of Daniel, because it's set aside for Daniel's people, the Jewish people. Um, it begins with this prince to come, who is the false messiah and an irrevocable covenant with many. Okay, so it tells us very clearly in Daniel 9.27 that this final week of seven years, which is the tribulation, will begin with a covenant. So scripture is parallel. It's showing us the same thing in different books. You know, Daniel says it begins with a covenant. Revelation is saying that this guy on the white horse who is trying to be an imposter Christ also has a covenant. It's, it's scripture is just confirming scripture. You just have to study it and put the pieces together. Okay. So Daniel 927 says, we know that the seven years begins when that guy, the prince that is to come, brings his irrevocable covenant with many. And Revelation chapter six is saying the same thing. The very first seal to pop is, or to be lifted from the title deed of the earth is this false messiah. Okay, another reason why this is the false messiah in Revelation chapter 6. The rider of the first horse, it says, rode forth conquering and to conquer. Hmm. This fits the description of the prince to come slash or the antichrist described in Daniel. Let me go back to Daniel. Why did I flip? I have so many sticky notes here. So in Daniel chapter 8, it gave us more of a description of who this prince is to come, this mighty conquering man who's going to come to power in the last and final seven years. Um, Daniel 8, 24, this is referring to the Antichrist. His power will be mighty, but not by his own power. He will corrupt and destroy in an astonishing manner. So this dude is ferocious. He, he has all the power and it's given to him by Satan. Remember, he's allowed to be given this power and as soon as the restrainer is removed, the Holy Spirit indwelling the church. So it's going to be a terrible time. And so Daniel is saying the same thing. This guy is a fierce leader, a mighty man. He's going to corrupt and he's going to destroy in an astonishing manner. And... Uh, Revelation chapter 4 says the rider on this horse is riding forth to conquer. Okay, same description, same idea. It's the first seal is the Antichrist. Now, we know that Jesus came. Jesus does not come to conquer and defeat his enemies until the whole entirety of the tribulation is over. So as, as soon as these seven years have played out and Satan has had his time of reign on this earth, in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16, you can read those on your own. That's when Jesus comes to fight his enemies and win. But it's just another distinction between the rider on this white horse, which is the first seal of tribulation, 
Um, that's the Antichrist. That's the, that marks the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. So Revelation chapter 6 is in perfect harmony with Daniel 9.27 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The tribulation begins. We can know without a doubt now, based on these three passages alone, that the tribulation begins with the prince that is to come, which is the Antichrist, which is the imposter Christ, and his covenant is confirmed. Based on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he cannot come to power until the restrainer is removed. The bride of Christ leaves, and the seven-year time of judgment begins. I'm just going to add this on here. I could give so much proof, but I guess that'll be a different teaching on, on Revelation chapter 4 and why that represents the actual event of the rapture. But I'm not going to touch that today. I'm just going to do one more point, and that is that because it's just so it's so wrong to believe and to teach that the church is going to be here for the seal judgments because it's just so not true it, it gives anxiety it gives questions like what part of the wrath are we going to go through when does he rescue us you guys he rescues us before any of it he rescues us before the first seal is even lifted and all of the seals are judgment Prophetically speaking, throughout the word of God, four horsemen, or just horses in general, are always symbolic of judgment. So these people make a, try to make a case that the real wrath of God doesn't, doesn't take place until the sixth seal. But it's just ridiculous on so many levels. Let's just, instead of saying that, I'm going to give you the proof. Let's talk about judgment and horses. So the first... For the four horsemen are also described in Zechariah chapter 6 too. There's a chariot with red horses of war. A second chariot has black horses of famine and death. And a third chariot of white horses of victory. And a fourth chariot has strong dappled horses which represent death through judgment. So if you look at Ezekiel 14, 21, it links those things which represent the horsemen to actual judgment because the sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence are judgments that come across and that come to the idolatrous elders of Israel. So a symbolic interpretation of the four horsemen links the riders and these horses to actual judgments that are coming upon a people. Now I really liked, this is an even stronger case, look at Joel chapter 2. This is another case where we see horses linked to judgment. I'm not going to read it all. I'm, I'm just reading the highlighted verses that I really, like, blew me away. Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion, for the judgment day of the Lord is coming. And then it says, there is a pagan people, a pagan and hostile people, numerous and mighty, the like of which has never seen before. And then it says in verse 4, their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and they run like wild war horses, like the noise of chariots. They leap on the tops of mountains, like crackling fire of flames, and all faces become pale with terror. They run like wild warriors. So the earth... The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. Sun and moon go, grow dark. So again, horses are linked to judgments coming to a people. The people that are here during this time are in absolute terror, okay? There's nothing... <laughs> horses are a symbolic picture of judgment. And then we also see later on in Revelation... This is interesting in Revelation 9, uh, verse 2. He opened the bottomless pit... And smoke like the smoke of a great furnace flowed out of the pit, and the sun and the atmosphere were darkened by the smoke from the pit. Jumping to verse 7, the locusts resembled horses, prepared and equipped for battle. And let's not forget, these locusts that also look like horses have a king over them, the angel of the abyss, the bottomless pit. In Hebrew, his name is Abaddon, and in Greek, he is called Apollyon. So we see throughout scripture that horses and horsemen are associated with judgment. The judgment of God begins at the first seal. Jesus is the one lifting the seals, the title deed of the earth. The wrath is pouring out from the first seal all the way through the trumpet judgments, all the way through the bull judgments. Don't let anyone tell you that. 
the judgment of God begins later or after a certain amount of seals are lifted. This, again, is meant to be a corrective teaching because there are false doctrines out there. Um, and it's meant to be a comforting teaching because we need to remember that Paul promised that the church doesn't go through the time of wrath. And he says that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He's not talking about hell. It's obvious the church doesn't go to hell, but he had just spent the majority of the book of Thessalonians talking about the return of Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 is the huge passage about the harpazo, the rapture. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 talks more about the day of the Lord and how we're to be watching and we don't live in the dark like the world does and we can see that day approaching. And then he reminds us that we're not destined for the wrath of God. In context, he's not talking about hell. He's talking about the, the judgment time, the time of seven year tribulation. Um, so again, be comforted, church. We are not here for any of the, of the judgments or the seals. We are only here for the birth pains, which are signs. They're signs. This coronavirus is a huge sign and just might be the final sign. You know, the huge locust plagues that are wiping out tons of food in Africa and parts of the Middle East. That's a sign. But it's not the judgment of God. If it was the judgment of God, the whole world would <laughs> be repenting. Like, seriously. But it's just a sign for those who are paying attention. And some people are turning to the Lord. Some people are buying Bibles like never before. Some people are, you know, all of a sudden receptive to hear about the gospel or the Bible and learn about it. And that's awesome. They're being wise. They're using the tiny bit of time that we have left before the rapture, before the wrath falls on this world. But I just wanted to comfort the church. We are not in the judgment of God. We are not going to see any of the judgment of God. We're in the final moments before the rapture. This is a warning to the world. Get right with God. Wake up, sleeping virgins. Get your oil filled. Get close to the Lord. Pay attention to the season we're in because Jesus always taught that paying attention to his coming and being ready for it is associated with being taken in the rapture. I have a separate teaching on the parable of the ten vir virgins if you're interested. They're all Christians. Five are taken, five are not. That's sobering. That's very sobering. So I don't want to drag this on forever. If you have any questions, let me know. I also have all the notes typed up in case you want to see them in writing. God bless you. I hope this encouraged you. That's what it was meant to do. Get in your word. The word is amazing.